good evening, and is this on, Pat? Is it on? Is that better? No? It's on? Okay. Um, welcome to tonight's speaker, um, David Hulse. Before we begin, I just have a couple quick announcements. Um, uh, upcoming speaker on next Wednesday, November 10th, is Seymour Hirsch, um, journalist that probably most of you are familiar with, and um, he will be speaking about the chain of command, the road from 9-11 to Abu Ghraib. And on Sunday, November 14th, we have Joseba Zuleika, that sounds confident, and um, he will be speaking on the follies, fables, and faces of counterterrorism. Um, my name is Lindsay Fazil, and I'm the co-chair of the Lectures Committee and Institute on World Affairs, and both of these are funded by GSB. And we also want to thank Greenlee School of Journalism and Political Science Department for tonight's event. Um, David Hulse is currently the Conservation and Sustainable Development Program Officer with the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Um, he's responsible for coordinating grant making in Asia and the Pacific. Um, before this, he worked with the World Wildlife Federation and um, worked in the South Pacific Regional Representative um, down in the um, Cook Islands, Fiji area. And he's an Iowa State graduate with degrees in Earth Science and Environmental Studies. And he also has a degree in Public Policy from Harvard. Um, just had dinner with him. He's a lovely person and we're going to So, David Hulse. Thanks, Lizzie. And everyone. I'm getting old, so I need to see if I can turn this light on. I guess I don't need it. Well, it's actually um, quite interesting and almost a little bit humbling to be back here at Iowa State and uh, in this very familiar room. We used to come see Friday night movies and things here. Never thought I'd be actually having an opportunity to talk to you here. I was on the lectures committee when I was a student for two years, so it's also nice to have a chance to um, have a reversal of roles. When I first accepted this invitation to talk several months ago, I knew it was going to be two days after the election. And so I knew no matter how the election turned out that a democratic approach to the environment would be um, a topic uh, that would be interesting. Uh, I guess democratic in a capital D or democratic in a small d. Um, in fact, for the next four years in the United States, we will not have a chance to have a democratic capital D approach to the environment. But uh, we do have a democracy small d, so we'll have to see what happens. Um, one of the earliest decisions that the Bush administration made in March 2001 was to abandon the United States' previous policy of engaging with the Kyoto Protocol. And I think that was the first of many uh, events that have happened in the last few years that make one question uh, the environmental movement here in the United States. Uh, previously, uh, under the Clinton administration, when there was trouble having the text of the Kyoto Protocol actually work. They sent Al Gore over to Kyoto. He helped uh, create uh, agreement. And at that time, the United States was the real leader and the role model for the environmental movement. It's, uh, I think, somewhat ironic that in the past few weeks, it was actually Russia, uh, President Putin and the Russian parliament, that ratified and approved the Kyoto Protocol and put it into effect when they exceeded the 61% mark. Uh, one would never have thought that Russia would be the country that would be the leader in the environment and not the United States. So does this tell us that the environment can only be saved under a democratic government, capital D, versus small d? I think it's somewhat more complicated than that. Um, a couple weeks ago, I had lunch with Senator Dick Clark. And uh, maybe some of you in this room will know who he is. Um, I actually am old enough that I had a chance to vote for him uh, in 1978, but that's the year that he lost. And uh, I pointed that out to him, that uh, it was a, a very important lesson as an 18-year-old at the time to look at the candidates, look at the issues, and say, oh, this is the right person. I want to vote for him. And then to realize that, that the right person can sometimes lose. But these days, Senator Clark works for the Aspen Institute. And that is a grantee of the MacArthur Foundation, where I work. And uh, one of the many good programs that the Aspen Institute does is nonpartisan congressional training programs that expose senators and representatives to a series of international issues. For instance, uh, next year they'll be holding a seminar down in Mexico that's going to focus on relations between the United States and several Latin American countries, particularly Mexico, Venezuela, and Brazil, who have three very interesting leaders, uh, Fox, Chavez, and Lula, who are all very different from one another. 
This year they conducted a tour of China where they looked at issues between the United States and China. And um, Dick Clark, he comes by the foundation about once or twice a year. Uh, it was about a year or two ago when I was first looking at the lists of the participants, the senators and representatives who participate in these uh, congressional meetings, and I noticed that they were about two-thirds Democrat, one-third Republican. And I asked him, well, wouldn't it be better if you would try to aim for more of a 50-50 balance, especially since the, the Congress and the House are about a 50-50? And he said, actually, they invite twice as many Republicans as they do Democrats to the congressional uh, to these congressional uh, training programs, and almost every Democrat accepts, and many, many Republicans do not. And then he went on to say that when they have training programs about environmental issues, almost no Republican will accept because that is a Democratic capital D issue that they do not think that they want to engage in. So what does this tell us? What does this tell us about people's willingness to learn? What does it tell us about exposure to new ideas? Well. That's not exactly what I'm supposed to talk about tonight. But um, it does make one ponder. In over 20 years of experience that I've had in Asia Pacific, I have seldom come across a country that has politicized the environment as much as the United States. And in fact, to me, thankfully, many of the other countries where I've had a chance to work are a lot more pr pragmatic in their approach to the environment. So. I want to talk to you tonight about eight countries. So I hope that's not too many. I'll try to be brief. And I'm going to group those eight countries into three categories. Uh, democratic, democratic but messy, and not democratic. And from that list of countries, I then hope that I can draw some lessons across the eight. And then we can open up the floor for questions and discussion, if you want that. But before we go any further, I just um, I want to explain, uh, I work for a foundation, and as a philanthropist and as a grant giver, we live a very sheltered life. Um, most of the time when I'm giving presentations or when I'm making a lecture, I'm talking to people who are probably going to ask us for money. And as such, they're overly polite. And um, if I speak too quickly or I get off track or you just get bored, stand up and wave and let me know, because it's really very seldom that I get honest feedback. Once I started um, in this job giving grants, it was amazing how I immediately became brilliant and insightful. Um, <laughs> people will listen and, and they'll be so ingratiating to us. But um, no one slipped me a proposal today, and I don't really think that anyone here is asking for money, so it'd be nice to have a chance to uh, just speak honestly and openly with everyone. I'm not considering any genius grants for anyone. So for democratic societies, I'd like to talk about Thailand and Fiji very briefly. Thailand actually is a very flourishing democracy. And um, there have been, in the last couple of uh, years, a bit of backsliding with Prime Minister Thaksin Sinawat, who does not seem to like criticism very much. He tends to take um, journalists to prison, or at least to court if they criticize him. It's kind of put a damper on freedom of expression in Thailand. But at the same time, Thailand is a country that has a strong civil society. It has a strong civil society movement in a lot of issues from farm prices, labor rights, HIV AIDS, the environment. And that has, I think, that environment has led to a very strong environmental movement in Thailand. A real pivotal moment in the movement was in 1988 when the Namchon Dam was up for consideration. It would have flooded part of a, a national park that has later become a World Heritage Site. And the, the movement to help the government decide, I guess, in a positive way of putting it, to shelve that that program was really a, a very crucial moment for the Thai environmental movement. And Supna Kasatiyan, who was the leader of that movement, became an overnight sensation in Thailand. Unfortunately, as the way things sometimes go in societies that we don't quite understand, Sup, uh, two years later, 1990, died by his own hand uh, as a sacrifice that he felt was necessary. And it was a, a real blow to the environmental movement. But it was also invigorating in a sad sort of way because King Bhumipun Adunyadate sponsored his funeral. And it was um, a real catalyst for the movement to realize that even the highest levels of the leadership of Thailand understood the power of the environmental movement. So I guess the lesson that we can draw from Thailand is that good environmental stewardship comes from the grassroots, and it can be a lever for local empowerment. OK, Fiji is also a democracy, uh, although they did have a coup when I was living there 
in May 2000. Ta Thailand had three coups when I was living there. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it makes it less democratic. But the point that's important about Fiji is that it's a very traditional society. Um, the fundamental factor in Thailand or in uh, Fiji that people talk about is the fact that the land and the sea belong to the people. Um, the community owns the land and the sea in totality. And actually, to indigenous Fijians, they cannot conceptualize the idea of land as being private property. They cannot conceptualize the idea of selling land. It's an alien concept that's outside of their, of their understanding. And when you're dealing with a society like that, where they feel a connection to the land, they say, this is our land. It's, it was our grandparents' land. It will be our grandchildren's land. It belongs to us as a whole. It makes um, environmental considerations so much easier. Building on that tradition, the MacArthur Foundation supports down there what we call the Locally Managed Marine Area Program. And our partners in implementing that are the University of the South Pacific, WWF, where I used to work, Well, Wildlife Fund, and the Foundation for the Peoples of the South Pacific. The idea of the Locally Managed Marine Area Network is to take this very strong concept of community ownership of the land and to somewhat strengthen it in terms of fisheries management and sea tenure. In um, traditional management of the seas in, in Fiji, they have a concept called tambu. Um, it's actually a word that we have in the English language, but the British, who always seem to misunderstand local words, mispronounced it and became the word taboo in English. But the tambu concept can be best described perhaps as saying no take. And a good example of a tambu practice would be if an elder at the village or if the chief were to die, they would declare a tambu on fishing in the area in front of the village. And there would be 100 days of mourning. And at the end of that 100-day period, they would lift the tambu. People would go out, and they would be able to harvest the fish and harvest the shrimps and the clams. And they knew that this was a sufficient amount of time to allow the seas to regenerate and to provide what they needed. And then they would have a big feast in honor of the person who deceased. Now, you would ask village elders, why do you do this for 100 days? Or why do you even have this concept of tambu? And they would say, we do it because it works. So the idea of the locally managed marine area program with the university was to try to bring science and monitoring to this tradition, to try to prove why it works, or to at least measure it so you could write it up in a peer-reviewed journal so it could be published. And a traditional management practice could then become part of the science and could become a real conservation practice. Uh, this work was recognized. MacArthur actually wrote it up, and we submitted it to UN uh, Development Program. And it was presented at the Johannesburg Summit in South Africa in 2002. And actually, it led to the awarding of an Equator Prize to that project. That was something we did not expect. But what we also did not expect is that the Prime Minister of Fiji was at the summit. And he had not even heard about the project had it not been for that event in Johannesburg. And so he asked the WWF and the university people to come and present the concept to the cabinet. And more importantly, they asked to have it presented to the Great Council of Chiefs, which is the highest traditional leadership body in Fiji. The chiefs endorsed the concept, saying, this builds on our traditions, it builds on our culture, and it is something that we want to have nationwide. And so now, all 410 traditional fisheries areas in Fiji that cover over 300 islands, basically the entire nation of Fiji, are under uh, the traditional practices of no-take and tambu. So what lesson can we draw from this? Uh, to me, it, it basically says that environmental movements can also work where cultural traditions and cultural values are an integral part of the environment, where people do not have to make a, a great leap in, in judgment or a great leap in faith to understand why the environmental movement is something that they should join. OK, now I'd like to talk about democratic but messy countries. And my examples there are Cambodia, Papua New Guinea, and Nepal. Now, Cambodia has certainly had a rough time since the early 1990s when they became a democratic country. Um, there was a, a coup in 1977, or ni 1997, excuse me, when uh, Hun Sen stopped the coalition government and kicked Hun Sen Pek out. Uh, a lot of aid donors decided to leave Cambodia at that time. Now, in Cambodia, OK, it is a, a sort of a democracy. And civil society movements exist, but they're certainly not encouraged. Uh, local leaders are often intimidated. But nonetheless, the international criticism that was coming to Cambodia at that time um, 
from mainly international donors who said, if you don't stop the logging, if you don't stop intimidating NGOs, non-governmental organizations, we are going to stop our aid to you. It was also at about that time when an organization called Global Witness, who some of you might have heard of, they became famous when they're the ones that publicized the conflict diamond issue in Africa, wrote a paper about the logging situation in Cambodia. Now, Hun Sen is not much of a Democrat, but he is smart enough to realize that poor environmental management uh, and poor environmental practices and corruption are not good for the country, and it's not good for the international sta stature of the country. So he did an evaluation of the logging concessions across the nation, and they shut down all of the logging concessions that were, quote unquote, illegal. One of the concessions belonged to Sam Ling, which was a Malaysian logging company, and it was in eastern Cambodia, it completely surrounded a national park. And the government asked the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is based at the Bronx Zoo, to take over the management of this logging concession. Now, it's an interesting concept, because whether you like logging or not, a logging company does provide a level of management to a forest. They protect the forest where they're not logging. They keep other people out that they don't want to have come in and steal their timber. And when the logging company leaves, you would have a vacuum. So the government felt compelled to ask a conservation group to manage that area. MacArthur Foundation gave a grant to WCS so that they could do this. What is the lesson in Cambodia? Good environmental stewardship makes good economic sense, and it makes good political sense. Okay, Papua New Guinea, also a democracy, very complicated country. Seven to 800 languages are spoken, many coalitions, many ethnic groups. Uh, personal gain uh, for, your, for your tribal group and for yourself seems to dominate more than any sort of uh, allegiance to the country. There are huge opportunities for corruption in Papua New Guinea. But at the same time, they have a good legal system. Australia helped to write the constitution when they gained independence in 1975, and so, in a country like that, where there's a sense of lawlessness, MacArthur Foundation has decided that our approach will be to work through the courts. When there are good laws, we will help communities and uh, individuals and small organizations to go to the court to set the legal precedents they need to show that the laws that are on the books need to be implemented. So we've given grants to Greenpeace, to a, an Australian group called the Environmental Defenders Office, and to two local groups, the Center for Environmental Law and Community Rights and the Environmental Law Center. But even with this sort of low, uh, low impact approach, non-adversarial approach, in the past few months, Annie Kajir, who works with the Environmental Law Center, and Ken Mondiai, who is the chair of the Ecoforestry Forum, have both been severely beaten. And uh, in the case of Ken, he was hospitalized. And of course, there's a lot of lawlessness in Papua New Guinea. Port Moresby is, is famous for uh, being dangerous. And random acts of violence do happen, and people get beat up there. But it's, it also seems a bit coincidental that these two individuals who had been so crucial to the environmental movement were, were beaten up. So what's the lesson out of that? Um, I guess uh, maybe we've had a couple of positive methods, messages, but you also need to learn that um, the environmental movement can also be viewed as a threat to those who seek to exploit natural resources for personal gain. And um, you just have to realize that. When you're, when you're threatening someone's way, their livelihood, when you're threatening a, a good thing to them, they're going to they're gonna fight back. OK, Nepal is a shaky democracy. I'm sure some of you have been there. Um, in the last few years, um, with a disillusionment in the people, many of the people in the rural areas, there is a, a new Maoist insurgency that's been going on for five or six years. Their main goal is to provide um, a, a Maoist society and to overthrow the monarchy. Now, King Barendra, the former king, seemed somewhat willing to negotiate with the Maoists and try to come up with an agreement and see what they could do. Unfortunately, in, in a bizarre twist, King Barendra and the entire royal family were assassinated in June 2001. And the new king, Ganendra, who's the younger brother of Barendra, seems not very interested in negotiating. So it's, it's really come to a stalemate in, um, in Kathmandu and Nepal. I was talking to some of my friends in Nepal a few weeks ago, and uh, Kathmandu Valley was, was um, completely paralyzed by a strike when the Maoists said, we're going to shut down the valley. And it did. It shut down the valley. And they said, what's amazing is that the Maoists at this point don't even have to show a single weapon. They just say, we're going to do this, and the people are afraid. Now, trying to find some positive out of that um, in May when I was in Nepal, I was having dinner with Chanda Gurung who was the country director for the WWF there. 
And he actually made an interesting observation. Previously, when um, they were still a complete constitutional monarchy or an absolute monarchy, and community organizers would go to the communities and meet with the villagers, they would be very reticent and they would not want to share their opinions. Now, um, as a result of the Maoists who, who come into the villages and they say, let's have a community meeting and let's criticize the government, in fact, that has taught the people that they have the right to discuss what's going on, that they have the right to criticize the government and they have the right, right to speak their voice. Now, it's unfortunate that the Maoists are also committing some very horrible atrocities, but they're there is something that you can maybe grasp that's coming out of this. I was speaking with a professor in the sociology department this afternoon trying to draw parallels between what's happening in Nepal versus the Shining Path uh, Maoist movement down in Nepal or in Peru. Another little uh, anecdote, one of the grantees in Nepal is the WWF. Uh, we are supporting them to work in Kanchenjunga in eastern Nepal. And one of the staff in that project was kidnapped by the Maoists. And this is a very common thing. They um, will kidnap people either to kill them or to rough them up and chase them out of town or else to ask for ransom. In fact, uh, I need to meet this guy and get to know him better. Um, they held him for about a week, the Maoists, and they released him unharmed. And when they released him, they said, we will not interfere with your work because we think your project is good and it is doing what we believe in. And, you know, I actually haven't told the MacArthur Foundation Board of Directors that we have a Maoist certified project. <laughs> but I think, again, the lesson there is good. And it's similar to what you could learn in Thailand. That good environmental stewardship and good environmental planning is empowering to the local communities. Um, the environmental movement is empowering to local communities. They gain a voice. They have the right to manage their resources, to exploit them or to sustain them and use them as they want. Okay, I'd like to then talk about some non-democratic countries. Vietnam, Bhutan, and Burma. Now, Vietnam is a country that I've lived in for seven years, so it's obviously a country that I uh, have uh, a deep affection for. It is also one of only five communist countries remaining in the world. When I first moved to Vietnam in 1990, there was no U.S. diplomatic relations with that country. Uh, it was under World Bank sanctions, and in fact, it was um, nearly impossible to import U.S. dollars into the country. We had to go to the State Department because at that time Vietnam was still controlled by what was called Trading with the Enemies Act. And um, in an interesting anecdote, completing all the paperwork that we had to do to give to the State Department to determine whether we would be able to go into Vietnam and work there, we had to argue that we were doing humanitarian work. Now, much of the time, conservationists spend their, their uh, efforts saying good conservation is good for development. Conservation is development. It's good for the economy. And in this particular case, we had to say, no, uh, uh, conservation is humanitarian only. It's for scenic beauty. And um, in fact, we, we won that argument. And Lawrence Eagleberger, who was the Deputy Secretary of State at that time, signed off on it. So we were able to go into Vietnam. We got money from the United Nations and from the Global Environment Facility to undertake capacity building programs for forest guards throughout the country. In the end, over a thousand forest guards received training, including master's degree level people who came to study in the United States, in Australia, and the United Kingdom. And it was uh, a real crowning achievement, uh, I felt, for the environmental uh, capacity of Vietnam. So what's the lesson out of that? I think it's similar to Cambodia. Good environmental programs make good economic and good political sense. At a time when Vietnam was nearly isolated in the world, they realized that the environmental movement was a way that they could engage internationally, that they could have international linkages, that groups could come in and exchange with them in a way that they had no other opportunity. Of course, they had many contacts with Poland and Czechoslovakia and uh, countries like that at that time, but to be able to work with an organization based in the United States was, was um, pioneering for them. Okay, Bhutan. Now, it's a little bit funny, I guess, in some ways, to talk about Bhutan in the same category as Vietnam and Burma. But in fact, Bhutan is not democratic. It is an absolute monarchy. It's a, it's a quirky little country. It's a lovely little country. But um, there is a process of a democratization going on. But that's not what's important. What's important in the case of Bhutan is that the people who live there are deeply religious. Um, they're deeply tied to their heritage and their culture. They're Mahayana Buddhist 
and because of that they have a deep respect and love for nature. The country retains 74% of its original forest cover and the protected area system of national parks covers 35% of the total land area. The people do not kill animals and they see the mountains and the forests around them as being part of their heritage and part of their culture. In fact, in a seminar we are talking about this afternoon of, uh, in Bhutan, the king has said he doesn't care about gross national product, he cares about gross national happiness. Because to him, what makes Bhutan unique and important is that the people have enough food to eat, that they respect their country, that they respect their culture, and that they have uh, a source of uh, deep devotion and religion. And those are what are valuable to them. So again, similar to Fiji, I think the lesson that you can learn is when you are surrounded by nature, when you rely on nature for your livelihoods, and when your culture and your heritage is so tied to the environment, then environmental stewardship is easy. It is part of your tradition. I'll conclude with Burma for the examples. Burma really is a difficult place. The SPDC, which was previously known as SLORC, has been in power since 1988. The international community has put Burma on uh, many, many sanctions. Uh, we've seen Aung San Suu Kyi in and out of house arrest. We've seen her beaten up. But after that amount of time, there unfortunately is a splintering occurring in the Burmese community. In fact, just uh, a week and a half ago, I went to the Burma Studies Conference, which was held at DeKalb, Illinois. Northern Illinois University is the center for Burma Studies. And some of the groups, such as the Open Society Institute at Soros Foundation, are very strong in saying we need to stick with sanctions. Other groups like the Burm Free Burma Coalition are saying, look, we need to try new approaches. It's just not working. They did not come to consensus. But interestingly enough, the European Union has concluded that they will probably broaden the definition of humanitarian to include sustainable rural livelihoods and the environment because they do not want the people to suffer and they see the environmental movement as being key to democratization in a place like Burma. So what's the lesson? Well, again, I think the reason that SLORC, or SPDC, the governing military council of Burma, feels so threatened is because, once again, the environmental movement is encroaching upon their entrenched interests. When no other country would trade with them, China has been a willing partner. Logs are being exported across the border into China all of the time. China needs the logs because they have a logging ban in place since 1998 when they had severe flooding. So the environmental movement is threatening what is important to them. So, conclusion. Okay, we've talked about eight countries and four lessons, and I'll just recap those. Thailand and Nepal, I think, show that the environmental movement empowers people at the local level. Fiji and Bhutan show that local traditions and cultural values are inherent to the environmental movement. And Cambodia and Vietnam both show that even when you're working in a less than friendly government or an undemocratic government, they can pragmatically learn that the environmental stewardship is expedient and good for politics. The less positive lesson comes from Papua New Guinea and Burma, but it's also a good one. And is that we need to keep in mind that entrenched systems that are corrupt, um, they, they will see the environmental movement as a threat and alternative means need to be addressed. Now that does make me wonder why the environmental movement in the United States, particularly in the last few years, has become so reviled. Um, I, it makes me wonder, is it because the environmental movement is seen as being a, a threat to entrenched interests, particularly in the western states? It shouldn't be viewed as such, and I think it's rather unfortunate that the, the discourse of the environmental movement uh, and the wise use movement out west has turned to that. Environmental movements can develop in all types of countries and in all types of systems. My experience is that environmental movements cross cultural boundaries, they cross economic boundaries, and they, co they cross um, different types of governments. Democracy is not necessary for an environmental movement, but I do believe that without democracy, environmental movements cannot flourish in the long run. Democracy also does not ensure that you will have a healthy environmental movement as we are seeing in some countries. What I think is more important, if you're trying to decide where you should work, the countries that are um, prone to having strong environmental movements, you need to look at the cultural values, at the economic and political pragmatism of the leaders of that country, and the spirit of local empowerment as it is part of 
the system of civil society in those countries. And I think that here in the United States, those are also the things that we need to look to. We need to see that uh, a good environment is part of our cultural value here. We don't need to talk about cowboy culture. We need to talk about the culture of Yellowstone and the beauty that we see around us and which we sing about when we sing America the Beautiful. And I think we also need to be economically and politically pragmatic that um, good environmental policies will be good for the economy here. And of course, I think all Americans do believe in local empowerment. So thank you very much. I don't know if that's long enough or good enough, but uh, I'd sure be happy to answer questions. I see a lot of familiar faces out there, even though I haven't been to Iowa for so many years. So thanks. <laughs>
is that um, one of the ways you can get carbon offsets is to plant a forest. And so if the Netherlands, for instance, needs to get some carbon offsets, they will buy uh, 10,000 hectares in Vietnam and say, we're going to plant trees there. And it's, it helps the Netherlands and it helps Vietnam. Um, and I think programs like that are good because they're paid for. It benefits the environment. So you can, you can really have some innovative ways of trying to encourage people to plant trees in their different countries. I think the thing that's bad about that system is that it says to a country like the Netherlands or the United States, if we were to adopt the, the, the protocols, is that, well, you don't need to fix your problem at home. You can just you know, plant some trees elsewhere. But you are, I think, absolutely correct. Um, countries that have made a concerted effort to uh, replant degraded hillsides, most of the time it works. Uh, of course, I have experience in Vietnam where some of the areas were so degraded, and then, of course, they have the added um, problems of dioxins and uh, poisons left in the hillsides from the defoliants from the Americans that um, uh, regeneration has not occurred. But in most cases where it's caused by natural, quote unquote natural, I mean people cutting it down, uh, exploitation, they can come back. And what's interesting getting back to the, the marine issue is regeneration in the marine environment is so much easier than in the terrestrial environment. Uh, the, the sea in the one hand is the ultimate sink, everything ends up there at one point, but it, it comes back so quickly. If, uh, if corals are damaged, if fish populations are depleted, Within a year or two, you can see results. On the land, you have to wait 10, 20, 30 years to see something. But in the long run, it will happen. There's also a, a movement in the West to take out dams and to try to recreate the environment that was there before. It's incredibly expensive, but it's, it's something that I know they're doing studies at uh, Colorado State and at University of Idaho in Moscow to really see, is this economically viable? And what they're learning about the cost of taking out a dam and recreating the environment is now becoming part of the equation of deciding whether they should build a dam in the first place, which I think is a very important consideration that um, they're doing. One of the grants that I'm looking at right now is in Yunnan in China, uh, Yunnan province. In the environmental impact assessment process in China, for instance, right now, biodiversity is not included as one of the criteria that you consider when you do an environmental impact assessment. You look at is, are there going to be erosion in the area? Is there going to be erosion? Um, will people be displaced? Issues like that. But nature conservation is not part of it, unbelievably. And um, so we're giving a grant to an institute in Kunming with the full agreement of the Beijing government to, to try to come up with a series of biodiversity measures that would be added to the environmental impact assessment process. And if that succeeds, hopefully it would also become nationwide. Nationwide in China is a little bit bigger than nationwide in Fiji. Uh, did that answer your question? Okay. Gary? Thank you, David. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, this is a question and a co uh, commentary note about uh, Iowa here. Uh, one question I have is just some reflections that you've had and experiences with multinational corporations mm -hmm. in those uh, countries counteracting the environmental movement and the money that goes into something like that. Uh, and that relates to, I think, interesting uh, dynamics here in Iowa and even here at Iowa State, particularly with the Sustainable Ag Program, the Leopold Center, mm -hmm. which has come under attack and doesn't have a lot of uh, support in certain circles here in Iowa and even here in the university, uh, especially of late. And uh, I was just another anecdote of talking to a friend who's thinking about they're, they're far, they're going to established a grass-based um, beef herd in eastern Iowa. And he says you have to be careful to even talk about that around certain circles because of, uh, you get around corn and soybean farmers, <coughs> that in itself is a threat that you would convert your corn and soybeans just to grass to raise beef because of trying to move towards a grass-based economy, which uh, I think would be a very good thing for, for, uh, for the environment and for our economy. More well, uh, sh shamedly, I have spent very little time in Iowa since I left 22 years ago. <laughs> but um, I mean, even back then, the, the no-till or low-till movement was beginning when I was in high school. And I didn't know anything about agriculture, but it seemed like in my heart it was a good thing. Um, in terms of the multinational corporations, 
by living in Vietnam, I was somewhat blessed because there were almost none there, and I didn't have to deal with them. A lot of my multinational corporation experience came when I was down in the South Pacific, where um, there are really, really nasty mining companies uh, working in Papua New Guinea and uh, New Caledonia. And they're either Australian or Canadian. Uh, most of them are not. Well, there's Freeport McMoran in, in Indonesia, which is American. They don't care, frankly. Um, my experience with them is, is limited, but when I was with World Wildlife Fund, if we went to go see them, they were kind of like, oh, we'll write you a check for $10 million and just go away. And they didn't get it that that's not what we wanted. Well, some, unfortunately, some conservation groups do want that. Um, I, I do think that I don't want to say which ones do do that. But some uh, conservation groups have made a point that they will never take money from a tobacco company or an alcohol company or, you know, whatever, or a mining company. Some do not. And um, there was an example in Bolivia where one person at WWF had actually agreed that they were going to help serve as an advisor on a pipeline project with, I can't remember who, it was a Gulf or Exxon or something. And, wow, did that cause a stir, and, and they back down. And another conservation group happily came along and took the $20 million in that case. So I don't have a lot of faith in multinational corporations supporting the environment, um, frankly. I'm glad that you're working at the Leopold Center. Um, he's a wonderful Iowan, isn't he? <laughs> I assume it's named after Aldo Leopold, right? OK. Um, my little anecdote about that is last year I was in Baraboo, Wisconsin. I met Nina Leopold, his daughter and um, had drinks at her house, and then we went to go visit the shack. And um, I was with George Archibald at that time, and I don't know if you know the International Crane Foundation. It's in Baraboo, and he's the founder of that. And when we were sitting around the fireplace in, in Nina's house, he said that all conservations need to go to two places in their life. They need to go to Baraboo, to the shack, and they need to go to Bhutan. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, an interesting story because Bhutan is a country that is so enshrined in its own cultural traditions and environmental movement. And Aldo Leopold um, was very influential to me when I first read San Colony Almanac in high school. And I don't know how many times I've read it since then. And I'm, I'm glad to, to know that you have the center here. Probably Senator Grassley and Senator Hart can help get it. I don't know. Um, I know that uh, it's good that we have friends in Congress in, in Washington, Leonard Boswell included, who can. Uh, get these things out here. But it's also important that people would think that that's not something that we should be doing and you'd be attacked. So, I don't know if that answer. <laughs> More questions? Um, how do we, like during this past election, obviously <coughs> Well, it's hard not to be political, you know, and let your views be known. Um, I guess, well, I don't know. Um, write letters to your Congress people. Um, let the, your senators know. Um, when those focus groups happen with CNN and they're going to, you know, those are going to be the numbers on the TV, let them know that environment is important to you. It is important. You're, you're right. The environment did not come up at all. Um, as Senator Clark uh, alluded to, a lot of Republicans on the Hill don't think that the environment is even an issue that they want to talk about. Um, and the further west you get, the, um, I think the, the worse the rhetoric is. I, I watch C-SPAN a lot. And I was watching the debate between the two senators in Alaska, uh, Senator Murkowski and Governor Knowles, who are running for the, the seat. And both of them were bending over backwards to say they love drilling in Anwar and, and all of this kind of stuff. <clears throat> and, you know, those are those are pretty serious issues, and it seems like uh, we're, we're, I think, really missing the boat in the environmental movement here in the United States. I'm not answering your question. I don't know either, other than to say as citizens we have to let our voice be heard. I mean, it, at least I think to a point we're getting beyond the question whether climate change exists or not. That's a start. And there are some people in, in Congress that are, I think, quite open on that. Um, uh, Congressman Holt from New Jersey is uh, a scientist, and he has been a very strong supporter of the environmental movement in talking about how science needs to be more of an important part of the debate in Congress. Rushhold, I think, is his name. And uh, so we need more people like that. That's all I can say, I guess. 
Hi, Bob. <laughs> hey, David, it's good to see you. We have some friends here. Our son graduated with David from high school, Alita. And uh, I still recognize you. I recognize and you, you and Tuck. You recognize me. That's amazing. <laughs> Our eyesight's good, anyway. Uh -huh. I was Although curious I can't read. with an early comment you made before you started your formal remarks when you indicated that uh, uh, Kyoto, but talked about Kyoto in passing. But as I understand it and remember, which uh, didn't both branches or at least one branch vote significantly against the Kyoto treatment? I mean, the treaty? I'm, I'm almost certain it was yeah. the Senate that did it that. Was like, it was like single digit against four, I mean, single digit four, and pro predominantly 80, 90% against. And I think even in the constitution of the makeup of the political parties at that time, as now, there's still a lot of Democrats. So you disparage the Republicans yeah. significantly, which I dislike. But understandably so, some are not as environmentally uh, friendly as you might like them. Mm -hmm. But of course, the global warming issue is a, from a scientific standpoint, still big question mark. Well, you're, I mean, you're very you, correct. You can disagree with that, obviously, and there are disagreements, mm -hmm. but quite frankly, from a scientific standpoint. Uh, but I say that to say this, that uh, we've come